It's a great pleasure. Well, welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure having uh, this very first uh, global health lecture of Axis Global, the alliance of uh, Creal Crecip and IS Global. Uh, we have been working with, uh, with Crecip for quite some time together and uh, sometime last year we decided that we should be uh, combining our, our knowledge and our efforts and um, aiming to uh, reinforce the work that both of us uh, are doing, both the centers are doing in, um, in research, in education, also in transfer of knowledge, and that's, that's also where IS Global is coming in. And um, this coincided with, uh, 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 with this call by the Generalitat of the SUMA call to, uh, unite, uh, to, um, to unite different centers in Catalonia and uh, do bigger centers that uh, have more capacity to do research. So that's where we are. We have the support of the General Tat to go on together. And uh, we have been taking several um, steps. This morning we were discussing the uh, very first joint projects that uh, we will be funding together uh, and that will be co-led both by Creal and Crecib. And it was a magnificent discussion on what possibilities we have to work together on issues of global health. And the aim is that in the next uh, year and a half, we will be working on joint projects, on, and on uh, plans for education and transfer. And at the end, we will, uh, uh, our aim is to build a very uh, a big center on global health in Barcelona, join Creal Crecib and IS Global. And part of this, uh, in part of this process, we decided that we will have this global health lectures that will help us bring here um, known scholars on issues on global health. And um, the very first one is the one of today. And it's uh, great that we are starting this. Um, the first one will be presented by uh, Neil Pierce, Professor Neil Pierce on um, uh, preventing global non-communicable diseases through low carbon development. And uh, Neil is a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he's also director of the Center for Global NCDs, non-communicable diseases, uh, at the London School of Hygiene. He has been in London for the last two years. He has been for many years in New Zealand where he was director, uh, he actually created and was director of a very successful uh, um, Center on Public Health Research at the Massey University. Neil has, uh, is a um, very well-known uh, epidemiologist. I'm sure all of you know his work either in methods or in uh, cancer, asthma. Now he's working on, on um, aging, on some of the neurological diseases, and very much focused on uh, occupational environmental exposures. So it's great that uh, he will um, talk about these issues that uh, He's working in London and that affects us. Uh, apart from being a very you know, internationally known researcher, Neil also has other qualities. Um, he, um, well, this doesn't, doesn't go down, actually. Let's see. Oops. So uh, he likes wine, he's a good connoisseur of wine. This is on his way when we uh, were in New Zealand to the Marlborough uh, wine, um, wine Festival. So it's part, apart from the global health issues and environmental and occupational exposures, we talk about wine with Neil. And there are some dark sides also in his, actually, in his uh, curriculum. And basically, he's a Chelsea supporter. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know how he managed from New Zealand to be a Chelsea supporter, but he is. So, um, Neil, thanks a lot for coming. Okay, thank you. Um, it's, I really appreciate the invitation to speak here, um, and particularly because this is the um, first event like this following the um, 
um, the, the alliance between Crayow and Cresib. The, there are two qualifications I should probably make at the beginning. Well, one is that I'm quite conscious that the real strength of Crayow and Cresib getting together, which I think is fantastic, is the link between infectious disease and non-communicable disease. So in some ways it's unfortunate that I'm going to be speaking almost completely about non-communicable disease and about their importance. But I would like to put that in the context that I think um, it's not only important for NCD researchers to work together, but it's also really important for infectious disease and NCD researchers to work together. So it's fantastic to see this happening. The second thing is that I will talk about many different topics most of which I'm not an expert in, and particularly I'm not an expert in low carbon development. So if you came along to hear the latest advances in low carbon development, you will be disappointed. I'm going to talk mainly about NCDs, but, um, and their link to um, low carbon development and how the two fields can work together. Um, so I'm going to do five things. I'll talk briefly about the, glowing, uh, the growing global burden of NCDs. I'll talk about the current paradigm for preventing NCDs globally. I'll then talk about why the paradigm falls short. Very briefly, I'll talk about climate change and sustainable development. And then I'll talk about how these different strands can hopefully be integrated in an alternative or complementary paradigm. So to start, um, global burden of NCDs, they have long been the major causes of mortality and morbidity in high income countries and they are now also um, becoming major problems in low income countries. Uh, about two thirds of global deaths are due to NCDs and um, particularly in high income countries, um, the sort of orange section here is um, deaths from non-communicable diseases. Um, blue is premature deaths from non-communicable diseases. So in high income countries, um, NCDs represent the, the bulk of the burden of deaths. But even in low income countries, they're becoming relatively important. So the burden is it's still more from infectious disease, but it's becoming almost a 50-50 um, a split. These are um, the most recent results from the Global Burden of Disease study, which appeared in the Lancet in uh, December. This is percentage of global deaths. Uh, basically, the red ones are infectious disease, and these sort of grey and light blue areas are non-communicable disease. This is males by age group, females by age group. And overall, NCDs accounted for about two out of every three deaths, particularly in the older age groups. You get a slightly different picture if you look at DALIs. DALIs are disability adjusted life years and they take into account both years lost because of death plus years lived with a disability. So they integrate the two problems of mortality and morbidity. Um, NCDs accounted for about 43% of DALIs worldwide. Um, this is essentially rich um, countries. These are poor countries, particularly Africa. You can see in Africa a uh, very high percentage is still from infectious disease, but a significant proportion is also from NCDs. So that's all I'm going to say about the global burden. NCDs are important, they're becoming more important as the world gets richer and more westernised, um, but communicable disease still remains a significant problem. Okay, what's the current paradigm for preventing NCDs? Well, it depends who you speak to and which part of the world you're in. But um, possibly because I'm in London, um, there you hear very much the, the Lancet approach to um, preventing um, global NCDs. And there's particularly a Lancet NCD action group, which I have a small involvement in. And that has been influential in influencing WHO and other agencies to develop the 25 by 25 strategy. And the target is a 25% reduction in mortality by the year 2025. And there's four priority diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, chronic respiratory disease, though the focus is, is very much on COPD. Um, there's five priority interventions. <coughs> four of them are about prevention, tobacco, salt, diet and physical activity, alcohol. The fifth one is the only one 
directly related to health care and is about essential drugs and technologies. And there's five priority targets. Accelerate tobacco control, reduce dietary salt, um, treat people at high risk of cardiovascular disease, reduce alcohol consumption, reduce physical activity. So that's basically the 25 by 25 strategy, which is quite dominant in most of the debates and meetings that I go to, and generally is um, the strategy that has been adopted, for example, by the UN um, high-level meeting on NCDs and by um, WHO. And there's, there's quite a lot of evidence to justify it, and I'll go through that briefly. This is from the Global Burden of Disease study. This is NCD deaths. Um, so this is in 2010 worldwide. We see that about 87% of NCD deaths are from these four diseases, cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory, basically COPD, and diabetes, whereas other NCDs don't account for quite a small proportion of deaths. And we also know that, um, so these diseases account for about 87% of NCD deaths, and we also know probably the most important risk factors for these diseases, including high blood pressure, smoking, cholesterol, overweight and obesity, physical inactivity, and so on. So the basic argument is that to tackle NCDs globally, we need to focus on these four um, types of NCDs and on these four risk factors plus um, essential medicines. And it's been argued in The Lancet that tobacco use, foods that high in saturated and trans fats, salt and sugar, physical inactivity and alcohol cause more than two thirds of new cases of NCDs. So that's the current paradigm and I think there's a lot of justification for it, and I should stress that um, since I'm going to spend the rest of the lecture criticising it, that I'm not trying to eliminate it completely, but to argue that it's not enough. It doesn't go far enough, it's too limited, and ultimately it will fall short of its goal. So <clears throat> why the current paradigm falls short? I'm going to talk about six reasons for that. First one is it doesn't work very well in high-income countries. Um, if we look at um, health promotion in high-income countries, <clears throat> probably the most successful or best-known project was the North Karelia study in Finland, which did everything that we are supposed to do for NCDs. It had local community support, mass media, workplace. They worked through primary care, hospital schools. They worked with food shops and industries and, and had um, extensive training programs. And this line at the top is the death rate from cardiovascular disease in North Karelia. And they started the study at exactly the right time. The death rate was going up naturally, it peaked, and then they started the intervention and the death rate came down. The only problem was that the death rate came down by the same amount in the control region of Finland which had no intervention. And it also came down um, by the same amount in the country as a whole. And it's not that these risk factors are irrelevant, it's that the campaign had no impact on exposure because everywhere people were lowering their cholesterol levels, lowering their bl blood pressure, um, changing their diet, smoking less. This was happening in the population as a whole because of many different complex trends. And on top of that, the health promotion program had, had virtually no impact. There's been a... Um, very nice um, Cochrane review done by Shah Ibrahim and George Davy Smith, which reviewed the results of many big um, community-based um, prevention trials. These at the time were, were the biggest and best that had been done anywhere in the world. And they basically all involved dietary modification, smoking, increasing exercise, some involved drug treatments. And if you put them all together, this line represents no change. This is a relative risk of one. So if the intervention was successful, the odds ratio is to the left of the line. If it was not successful, it's to the right of the line. And if you put together the, all of the evidence from the biggest and best randomized trials that have been done, this is what you get. Um, you get an odds ratio of 0.96. So there was a, um, for what it's worth, non-significant 4% reduction in CHD death rates as a result of these very intensive campaigns. And I should stress again, it's not that um, these risk factors are not important, it's 
uh, for reasons I'll talk about more in the rest of the talk, focusing on these risk factors and trying to persuade people to change their behaviour doesn't work very well because there are much stronger forces at play. So that's the first reason. Second reason is um, that it's important to consider morbidity as well as mortality. So if we look at DALIs rather than mortality, these four diseases actually only account for 50% of the global burden of NCDs. What are the others? Neurological disease, mental health, musculoskeletal conditions and other. So if you think about DALIs, which actually incorporate deaths as well as disability, uh, years with a disability, you get a, quite a different picture that um, focusing on these four diseases is only really dealing with half the problem. So these um, diseases only account, in fact, for about 50% of the DALIs or 50% of the NCD problem. So what's missing? Well, there's a whole bunch of other NCDs that are missing. Um, one example is mental health. Um, this is high-income countries, middle, low-income countries. This, these are um, uh, DALIs. These are DALIs due to mental health, and these are um, years of life lost or death due to other NCDs. And you can see that in high-income countries, mental health actually contributes a very large proportion of the burden of NCD morbidity. And even in low-income countries, it's um, beginning to account for quite a considerable proportion. If you break that down, um, this is a paper from the, the Lancet based on the GVD 2005. Um, you, a lot of it's from schizophrenia, um, dementia, substance and alcohol abuse, some of it's also from, other neuro, from neurological disease like epilepsy and other neurological disorders. And if you put those together, they actually account for quite a high percentage of the NCD burden. Um, it, mental health disorders are also strongly associated with many other health outcomes. Depression increases the risk for onset of hypertension, smoking, MI, stroke and so on. And it's a common sequelae of heart attack, stroke and diabetes. And a high comorbid presence is often seen in cardiovascular disease, stroke and diabetes, and also with many uh, infectious diseases. And depression is also affected, is also associated with worse adherence to treatment, with um, whether people follow our advice on behaviour modification, whether they're prepared to change their diet and exercise, and therefore it's also associated with worse prognosis from diseases such as heart attack, stroke and diabetes. Um, second example is asthma. This is from the Isaac study which I helped organise, um, which um, involved about 100 countries worldwide. These are the phase one results. I won't go into them in detail except to say that we have very high prevalence in Western Europe and particularly English speaking countries, low prevalence in most parts of the rest of the world, but that's like appears to be changing over time. So as the rest of the world becomes more westernised, um, asthma prevalence seems to be going up. And that's quite significant because the current global prevalence is about 15%, but it's about 30% in the UK and about 3% in some Asian countries. And if, as we suspect, the rest of the world becomes more westernised and asthma prevalence increases, we're going to see increases in prevalence from 3% to 30%, and therefore we're going to see major costs for health services and patients and a major burden of chronic disease, which we can do almost nothing to prevent because, as most of you know here, we are still studying asthma, we are learning lots of interesting things, but we don't know much about how to prevent it. So none of this figures in the GBD calculations because this is morbidity which is coming rather than morbidity which is here now. So we can't just focus on these four diseases. We have to consider NCDs as a group, and um, that includes mental illness, neurological disease, asthma, and, and a number of others. And the problem is that these four risk factors, in general, are not very important for these diseases. Obviously, alcohol is important for um, mental health, and the other risk factors um, affect these diseases to some extent, but it's not a simple fit. It's not like 
These factors cause 80 per cent of these diseases. They don't cause a very high proportion of these diseases. And what does cause these diseases? Well, in a lot of cases we don't know. Um, neurological disease in particular, um, there's a lot of good research being done, including work being done here, but um, we don't know a lot about the cause, causes of major neurological disease. What we do know about the causes of these other NCDs um, is um, generally involves different risk factors. And I'll give a couple of examples. Um, about the missing causes. First thing is infections, and um, so I've, I've got to mention infections once during this talk, um, and um, I won't say much about these because um, there are many more experts on, in this area uh, in this room, including HPV and cervical cancer, hepatitis B and liver cancer, H. pylori and stomach cancer, and HIV. Now, these actually account for uh, a non-trivial proportion of cases in high-income countries and quite a high proportion of cases of NCDs in low- and middle-income countries. And the striking thing about this list to me is that I, th I started studying epidemiology in 1980 and I think that all four of these have been discovered since then. So when I started it was felt that infectious disease was on the way out, it wasn't important. And the fact that such major causes have been discovered in the last few decades means that there are many more causes out there waiting to be discovered and they're likely to be in low and middle income countries where the discoveries will be made. Second example, asbestos or occupational exposures in general. This is a book I edited with um, Manolis um, at, um, when I was at IARC in 1993. Um, unfortunately, I still have the same slide that we prepared then. I, I do intend to update this one day, but the, the numbers haven't changed very much. This is worldwide asbestos production up to 1990. It's gone down a bit since then, but not a, um, not a huge amount. So it's just that the problem has moved to developing countries. And in general, the major occupational causes of NCDs are now in developing countries. They're not well recognised because um, occupation is probably less important than it used to be in high income countries. They don't feature well in the GBD estimates. And also there's a problem with the GBD estimates. I was on the occupational group. Um, but the problem is that the GBD methodology only considers current exposure. So in Western Europe where currently almost no one is exposed to asbestos, produces very few cases, but of course there are many cases still occurring from exposures in the past. So for both of those reasons, occupational exposures have been, their effects have been underestimated. Environmental exposures, <coughs> once again there's um, experts on this here, um, but the GVD study estimated that outdoor air pollution um, caused about three million deaths um, per year, mostly from respiratory disease, and also indoor air pollution from um, solid fuels, um, cooking inside, also caused about three million deaths per year. Um, example, that was example three, this is example four, um, arsenic. Um, some of you will know this story, but about 137 million people in the world are exposed to arsenic through drinking water Half of them are in the area of Bangladesh and, and West Bengal. Um, this is one of um, the triumphs or non-triumphs of international aid. Um, there was a problem with infectious disease from um, contaminated water. So UNICEF and the World Bank and many ag agencies um, funded the digging of wells in the 1980s. And no one realized at the time that the water has naturally very high levels of arsenic. And in fact, if you drink the water from some of these wells, you have more than a doubling of lifetime mortality risks from liver, bladder, and lung cancers. So this is a very significant environmental exposure, which once again doesn't really feature in um, estimates based on uh, risk factors in Western countries. So we now have a more complicated picture. Um, there are a number of diseases that, we, that are missing and we have a number of um, causes which were missing from the, from the standard um, model. 
Um, the final thing, well, there's two more things that are missing. One of them is consideration of the causes of the causes. You know, why do people adopt particular diets? Why do they exercise or not exercise? Why do they smoke or not smoke? And I'll give a couple of examples. The first one relates to urban design. Um, these are obesity trends amongst US adults. Um, essentially, blue means low prevalence of obesity. Orange or red means high prevalence. This is 1990, 1998, 2006. And I think it's something like 2025, in fact, when more than half of the US population will be obese by um, the standard definition. Now, how do these trends come about? Well, there's been a lot of emphasis on food, which is important, but um, it doesn't actually look like the amount of calories people are consuming has gone up very much. It's, it's probably gone up enough to have an impact, but exercise also has an impact, and this is largely affected by the urban environment. This is an old-style US neighbourhood. You would walk around, your children would, would walk to school, because there was not so much concern about safety, you would walk to your friend's place, to the mall or the local shops. This is um, a more modern US environment. I lived in a suburb like this um, for two years. There were no sidewalks, no footpaths, so, so walking was very difficult. You would never let your children walk to school. You would drive them to school. You would drive them, drive to your friend's apartment. You would drive to the mall. And walking became very difficult because the whole area was designed for the motor car. And we're seeing this in other parts of the world as well, that um, walking is becoming impossible or dangerous. I tried to go running in Delhi um, three weeks ago. It was a life-threatening uh, experience. Um, <clears throat> very difficult. So if you, if you don't exercise as part of daily life, what do you do? Well, you go to the gym. And, um, I thought this photo must be fake, but I've, I've met two people who worked in this gym. It's in San Diego. And I showed this um, slide to um, Susan Preston Martin, who's a friend of mine, a cancer epidemiologist. And she said, well, our gym has valet parking. So you, you drive up to the front door, you hand the keys over, and then you exercise on the machine. And then when you finish, your car is waiting for you outside. You drive home and sit on the couch. So it does illustrate the way that exercise has been removed from daily life and it's become something that people choose to do. And whether you choose to do it depends a lot on your circumstances. If you're struggling to survive from week to week and an epidemiologist comes along and says you should stop smoking because you have a 20% risk of lung cancer in 30 years' time or you should exercise more, it's quite a logical to ignore them because you have more pressing problems. If smoking help, helps get you through the day, if your family, your friends smoke, um, if it's difficult to exercise, and it, it requires more forward thinking, which doesn't come naturally if you're poor, basically. This is another example I saw actually on the tube um, in London. It's a firm called Balance Box, which helps you diet. You'll get a scrummy breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks full of tasty goodness for each day, ensuring you shed the pounds and get the right nutrients to keep you on the go. But the real selling point is that it's fresh, ready, prepared, and delivered right to your door. So you don't even have to walk to the supermarket to pick it up. You can sit on the couch all day with your remote control. They will deliver it to your door, and you just eat what's in the box. Um, so there's no need to shop or chop. We do the lot. So the basic problem is not that people are lazy. This is a book by Hu, um, published in 2008, who says, leisure, leisure time physical activity accounts for only a small part of total physical energy expenditure. Although leisure time physical activity has not decreased and may even have increased moderately, this has not compensated for the substantial decline in occupational household and transportation activities. Thus, overall physical activity in the population has decreased considerably. And that's happened so gradually over time that most people have not necessarily noticed it. This is a quote from Jared Diamond, a book called Collapse. 
and um, he addresses the question, who cut down the last tree? What did the Easter Islander who cut down the last palm tree say as he was doing it? In fact, the changes in forest cover from year to year would have been almost undetectable. Only the oldest islanders, thinking back to their childhoods, could have recognised a difference. Gradually, Easter Island's trees became fewer, smaller and less important. No one would have noticed the falling of the last little palm sapling. And I think the same thing has happened to some extent with exercise as part of daily life, that um, mo most of you are, are young and so you don't know what things were like 30 years ago. I remember what things were like 30 or 40 years ago, but you don't notice a big change. You just notice that each year there's a new labour-saving device, life has become a little bit easier, um, there's a remote control so I can stand here rather than um, use a pointer. I only realised yesterday when I was reading something that even office work has become much more sedentary because people used to spend quite a lot of time walking to get files out of the filing cabinet and now we just click on the screen. So there's been a very gradual change which has meant that exercise has largely been removed from daily life. Second example, um, poverty. Um, there's a huge literature on poverty as a cause of NCDs. Um, poverty strongly affects individual behaviours like smoking and exercise, as I mentioned before. This is sort of being incorporated in the NCD agenda, but not necessarily in the best way. This was a paper published in The Lancet in January, and basically the group advocating that we just focus on tobacco and salt and so on, they are um, using that to say that we should also do that as part of the sustainable development agenda. In other words, we should take action on the NCDs because that's part of development. And that's true. Um, NCDs should be embedded in the post-2015 human development agenda since they, through their effects on the societal, economic and environmental domains, impair the sustainability of development. And that's true. But there's also very strong uh, drivers in the opposite direction, that some drivers of unsustainable development, such as the transport, food and agriculture and energy sectors, also increase the risk of NCDs. Okay, so we now have quite a complicated um, picture that we have more diseases, we have more causes, and we have the causes of the causes which strongly determine whether people smoke or exercise and, and what diets they have. Finally, um, I'd like to mention the role of healthcare because that's largely been left out of a lot of debates. Um, and I'll give two examples. One is asthma. Like I said, asthma is increasing worldwide. There's almost nothing we can do to prevent it. We genuinely do need more research. Um, but in the meantime, there's a great deal that we can do to improve asthma management. And I'll show you briefly um, a study I did in New Zealand. Well, in fact, the first, there's two studies. We did one in Tonga, and, but this was following on from one we did in New Zealand. Um, this is me. Um, quite a long time ago. Um, this is a thing I was involved in called the Māori Asthma Review. Um, that found that in Māori children who are basically the indigenous people, relatively poor, um, asthma prevalence was no higher than the rest of the population, but there were big problems of access to health care and asthma education, and there were need for simple self-management plans. Um, so we developed one. We did a before and after trial. Marae based is just a Maori community centre. And we found that basically people got better. Um, their lung, lung function increased. Um, the number of nights woken um, fell. Um, but also a number of other things changed. And this is from a PhD that a Maori researcher did with me, which was a more qualitative study where she interviewed the people and said, it made me realise that if I can manage to control my asthma, I can manage other parts of my life. My house is smoke-free, the whānau is the family, accept it. It was a big change. And what's very striking uh, was that people not only stopped smoking, but their family stopped smoking. And it's because they realised for the first time in their life they could actually do something to help make them healthier. And it's... A point that's made um, more generally in a paper in The Lancet, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, but just to finish off the story about asthma, 
This Isaac International Study of Asthma and Allergies in Childhood, we've got together with the union, the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease. We produced this global asthma report for um, the UN summit, and we've developed this global asthma network, and its main role over the next couple of years is actually to deal with asthma management. To, um, there's a thing called the Asthma Drug Facility, which is organising access to cheap generic drugs, and um, we're doing what we can to essentially improve asthma management in low- and middle-income countries. These issues were explored more generally in uh, a paper in The Lancet published in um, January, which said that management of NCDs and multimorbidity will be particularly challenging, challenging in low- and middle-income countries. In many countries, long-term care that includes follow-up at clinic and repeat prescriptions is a new idea for many patients and health staff. Um, where this approach has been successful has particularly been in uh, HIV and tuberculosis, and in um, some countries, the people are beginning to build NCD management programs on the top of HIV and tuberculosis programs. And it's a good place to start because Patients with HIV, even in low- and middle-income countries, get seen by the health services regularly. So there's a good opportunity, and they're at higher risk of NCDs. So there's a good opportunity to add in healthier initiatives. And more importantly, uh, they say, um, one of the authors of this paper was Peter Piot, who's director of the London School, but who was a director of UNAIDS. And um, basically, he emphasises very strongly that it's not just a matter of a magic bullet. It requires a broad-based response involving all the different parties and the, the community, but also that it's very hard to make progress on NCD prevention unless you're also providing treatment. And that's one of the lessons from HIV. You're not going to succeed in screening or prevention unless you actually offer health care to the cases that you identify. So, um, where we can get people to change their behaviour, it's likely to be um, through contact with the health services. Okay, so um, we're now left with a very um, complex picture, that there are many different NCDs, there are many different causes, and um, there are causes of the causes, and also management's important. I'll talk about one more topic briefly before I, I try and um, present some very um, generic solutions. Climate change and sustainable development. Um, these are slides I borrowed from Andy Haynes at the school. Um, but it's a very good paper in Nature by Rockstrom, which talks about the safe operating space for humanity. We've exceeded that with regards to climate change. We've greatly exceeded it in a couple of other areas, and we're likely to exceed it um, in a number of other areas, for example, global fresh water use in the next few decades. And I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen these sorts of slides before. This is the global ecological footprint. This is um, the level at which we can sustain humanity with one planet, and Africa and the poorer parts of Asia Pacific are below that but everyone else is way above it, particularly North America, but also Western Europe. The related issue is of uh, sustainable development. And um, as was discussed this morning, in fact, the existing Millennium Development Goals will expire in 2015. There's a big debate going on about what should happen to them and what will replace them and whether health will feature in the new framework. So, I got thinking about this. It wasn't an original idea. Many people have thought the same way. But I was at um, a WHO Europe meeting on environmental health, um, actually with Andy Haynes, uh, last year. And the striking thing was that everyone seemed to be depressed. Um, the environmental health people were depressed. They were losing the battle on climate change. And they were saying, well, this NCD global stuff is really going places. Maybe we should stress that climate change will prevent NCDs. And the NCD people I know, they are all depressed, um, unless they really believe that we can beat this just by tackling tobacco and salt and so on. So it got us thinking about these three agendas, preventing NCDs, combating climate change, and sustainable development, and what they have in common, which is actually quite a lot. And... Um, 
smart development choices can reduce not only pollution and injury but also improve health. And the, there are considerable health benefits of a low carbon economy. Um, these operate not through the health services but through housing, transport, food and agriculture, electricity generation and so on. So a couple of um, slides on possible solutions. Um, these are all borrowed from other people, some from Mark Neuenhausen here. Um, the built environment, this is proportion of trips in urban areas made by walking and cycling in North America and Europe. This is the United States, this is the Netherlands. It's not that Dutch people are less lazy than other people. Believe me, I've worked with lots of Dutch people, they're just as lazy as everyone else. Um, it's just they live in environments which are better suited to um, cycling and walking. So if you improve conditions, you can prom promote physical activity. Um, a very nice study that was done here by um, Mark and others was TAPAS, um, Active Transportation Health Impact Assessment. They um, estimated that cycling to work three hours a week reduced overall mortality by 28%. Um, but what was really striking was that physical activity also showed a protective effect against dementia and Alzheimer's disease and depression and anxiety and so on. So here you actually have a risk factor that affects virtually all NCDs rather than just one or two of them. This is a um, UK study. They estimated that if you cycle to work in London, um, you have an increased risk of death from road traffic crashes, but a reduced risk for breast cancer, dementia, um, stroke, ischemic heart disease. So this is um, premature deaths. I can't remember um, what um, the denominator is, but basically um, by cycling to work, if everyone did it, you'd have 50 to 100 um, more deaths from road traffic crashes, but thousands of fewer deaths from ischemic heart disease. This is a similar study in the Netherlands, which, which essentially found the same thing, but presented it a different way. They showed that if you, you uh, indulge in active transport, um, on the average, you lose one week of your life from your increased risk of road traffic injury and a bit from air pollution, but you gain about 32 weeks of life from increased physical activity. Now, now one qualification there, um, you spend most of those 32 weeks on your bicycle. Um, so. <laughs> Similarly, if you go running every day, you increase your life by about the amount of time you spend running. So, um, so I think epidemiologists think people should be convinced by these figures, but um, people think a bit more you know, uh, laterally than that. So I think the advantage of active transport is not only that um, you lengthen your life, but um, by the amount of time you spend running. But um, the rest of your life is better too, in terms of mental health, um, in terms of quality of life, in terms of feeling better. So it's, you need a more integrated approach to these things. Okay. Second um, possible solution relates to food. Um, we know what's happening with supermarkets all over the world. These are modern supply chains which are spreading a new culture. And the most striking thing is the increase in um, consumption of meat. Um, this, I think this is... Um, high-income countries and this is low-income countries and there's just a huge increase of um, uh, meat consumption all over the world. And um, beef accounts for a very high proportion of emissions um, affecting climate change and livestock production and of course fat in itself is not good for you and it's been estimated that reducing animal source saturated fat by 30% in the UK could reduce heart disease deaths by about 15%. Um, what's um, striking in the um, current debate, um, uh, well, particularly in the UK, everyone now is terrified of eating hamburgers because there's horse in it. Um, horse, is, horse is probably healthier, um, but um, nevertheless, no one wants to eat horse because that's what the French do, you know, and the, the English wouldn't do that. But what was really striking in the um, newspaper stories was where the food had come from. And the, a lot of the contaminated food had come from Romania through an agent in Cyprus and then ended up in, through France and into the UK. 
And it really shows what's happened with food production, that it's become a global enterprise and we've completely lost um, track of where the food comes from and what's in it. So increasingly people are arguing that sustainable diets are those diets with low environmental impacts which contribute to food and nutrition security and a healthy life for present and future generations. These are protective, respective of biodiversity, ecosystems and so on. And essentially what it means is, um, you know, ideally we'd be a lot healthier and climate change would be better if the slow food movement could take over the world and we could have a lot more locally resourced food which would be both good for our own health but also good in terms of development. Finally, air pollution, um, very quickly, outdoor air pollution is obviously um, very important uh, and indoor air pollution is also very important. Um, it's been estimated that we could avert about a million deaths a year by providing safe uh, indoor stoves and this would also have other effects like reducing deforestation, urban air pollution and climate change emissions. Okay, finally, um, I'd like to say a bit about the general living environment because I think as researchers we tend to focus on one thing. We focus on cycling or tobacco or salt um, and um, there's good reasons to do that for research but normal people don't think that way. Um, they think more about how they would like to live and um, it comes as a package. And uh, they won't necessarily vote to um, eat less salt or um, even to smoke less, um, but they will vote for smoke-free environments, they'll um, vote to have safer neighbourhoods, and the spin-offs from that are the things that we would like in terms of preventing NCDs. Um, this is um, a slide I borrowed from Ian Roberts, but this is um, different visions. This is um, lo typical London in some parts. Um, vision one, you get rid of um, well, you, the cars and the pedestrians and the bikes share the road. Number two, you get rid of the cars and just have buses. And vision three, you just, um, just walk around. And um, these are the estimates in, of disability adjusted life years gained for each of the three visions. And vision three is the most um, successful, but visions one and two also have a significant impact. And this is actually starting to happen in some parts of London now. Um, copying what's been done elsewhere in Europe. For example, if you go to the Natural History Museum um, in London, which is in Exhibition Road, um, that street has now been made multi-use. Um, cars, cyclists, uh, they've removed the footpaths. Cars, cyclists and pedestrians all use the road. Pedestrians have priority, cyclists next, cars next. And it does appear to reduce the number of deaths um, quite considerably. Um, this is a photo I took, um, this is my street in London. I took this at 8am on Monday morning. Um, London is actually one of the best cities in the world now to walk around and it's all because of the congestion charge. And people wouldn't have voted for that in terms of preventing NCDs, but they would vote for it just because it's nicer to live that way. And um, what you're increasingly finding is that you don't need a car. Um, this is my car here. Um, this, is, uh, this is the uh, car share scheme. You sign up once a year, costs very little, you only have to do the paperwork once, and any time you have a swipe card, any time you want a car, you can log on and um, just go and use it. And you can rent it just for an hour or just for two hours or for a whole day if you want. And increasingly, there's more and more people like me in London who don't have a car because it's easier not to have a car. The public transport is good, you can walk, and when you do need a car, you, um, you borrow one of these. And there's lots of them around. There's one, actually one around the next corner. There's about five within um, several hundred metres. So I think we'll really be making progress when we have more and more people who actually decide not to own a car, not because it's the right thing to do, but, it's be, but because it's easier and it's cheaper to, um, to not have a car. Um, what I'd like to do before finishing is um, just show you five minutes of a, um, of a video of an initiative in Bristol, if I can get it to run. And um, then I'll, um, I'll show a few slides to finish. So let's hope this will run through your um, screen. We've actually lost the sound. Uh, uh.
traffic problem, and um, brought them together and just explored the street space as play space. So we thought just doing short after school road closures was a really good and easy place to start. Um, it's been quite a good opportunity to get children out and do a bit more, but also um, for me to meet some of the ordinary I just think we don't, you know, we don't do enough things as a community anymore and that makes me feel really sad having been able to play anywhere I wanted, any time I wanted and call on anyone if I needed help. Um, that make, it makes me really sad that that doesn't... Okay, I'll just try and go back to the, my last slides. So... So just to finish up, how, how do we make these things happen? Uh, it's not easy. Um, one possible tool is health impact assessment and because I think part of the reason that the global approach to NCDs has been so simplistic and um, focused on four or five bullet points is that there's been um, a real emphasis on influencing WHO and the sort of things that WHO can do which are fairly limited. But what we need to do is to influence all of the government agencies within each country and all of the international agencies. And it's still not clear to me what's the best way to do it, but health impact assessment is one way that, that is possibly helpful. So that it's not that health trumps everything else, but that when people build a new motorway or build a new um, railway line or um, adopt a housing policy, that at least they take the health impacts into account and that health is at the table in all the decisions that are made about the environment. Um, just to finish with a story, this is, I wonder why I moved when I see this, but this is where I lived in New Zealand. Um, this is me um, at night answering important emails from Europe um, with a glass of wine to protect my health. The reason I show it is that shortly after this photo was taken, the um, Transport Authority decided they needed to, to widen Highway 1, which was a fairly small road, and make it a proper motorway. And the only way they could do it in my area was to wipe out half, the, half of the beach. And um, my house was just going to be okay, but they were going to destroy the local general practice and the house of the woman who was head of the Public Health Directorate of the Ministry of Health. So we got together and did a submission. Of course, many other people did submissions, but ours was the only one on the health impacts of this sort of environmental policy. And there were many other submissions, but eventually we succeeded. And you can um, present quite strong arguments that maybe they're losing, uh, they're saving 50 million by putting the motorway over the beach rather than going inland, but there will be costs elsewhere where in the system, and they have to take the health effects and the health costs into account. Okay, so we started with a very simple picture, which is to a large extent the official story. We ended up with a very complicated one, and I can see why um, many people prefer the simple one. Um, four or five bullet points is enough for anyone to, um, uh, to deal with, particularly organisations like WHO. And there's been a real debate in the literature saying, should we only have four things to act on or should we have 20 or 30? And there was a very strong feeling that WHO and other agencies couldn't cope with 20 or 30. 
best to keep it simple and just focus on these, um, these four basic diseases and four or five basic risk factors. So I can see there's, there's a strong logic to that. The only problem is that if that approach involved dealing with 90% of the problem, that would be fine. Maybe we could deal with the other 10% later. But it's dealing with a lot less than half of the problem in terms of the diseases that we should be addressing, in terms of all the exposures, and in terms of these higher level, um, uh, higher level influences. And I should stress that um, I'm not against tobacco control. I'm not against doing something about salt. We should keep on doing those things, but we should recognize that it's not enough. Um, and that we do need to take the big picture into account. And to some extent, if we really take the big picture into account, we don't have 20 or 30 bullet points. We, we have one bullet point, which is about the joint um, benefits we would get from taking action on climate change, taking action on sustainable development, and at the same time preventing um, NCDs. I think if you think back to the diet example, for decades, we would find that eating broccoli protected against colon cancer and it would get published in the Daily Mail and then the next week someone would find the opposite and um, people got very confused and quite annoyed. And it's really be partly because we all believe our, our own findings and not other people's, but also the way we do research, we have to focus on one thing often. Um, and people get very disillusioned with that and it's not very effective. But if you put it all together into something like Mediterranean diet, it's a package which is actually very appealing. And if you think about diets around the world in terms of um, uh, their value, their healthiness and so on, you know, Scottish diet would be zero, Mediterranean diet would be very close to 10. And you can actually sell the idea of Mediterranean diet um, very successfully because it integrates a whole lot of other things. And I think just to finish, what we need is the equivalent of um, the Mediterranean diet for environmental health. It's about healthy environments compared to unhealthy environments, and people will vote for those and support them, but won't necessarily um, vote or um, follow our advice if we get them to change individual behaviours. It's like telling someone to eat more broccoli while changing nothing else in their diet. It's very difficult to do. So I'm not saying that's easy, and I'm not saying this replaces the official sort of approach uh, to these things, but it's really important to keep the big picture in mind. And um, there's uh, a lot of potential if we do, because if we combine these three strands, then hopefully the whole can be more than the sum of its parts. Okay, thank you. was great, wasn't it? So let's get some questions and comments. We have some time for discussion and then we will have a pika pika outside. Mikael. Thank you very much, Neil. I'm not sure whether I will continue listening to music while I bike back and forth to work. <laughs> I managed to survive three accidents, but... Um, um, what about the, the, the current political and economic uh, state of the world? Um, should we say something about... Could you comment something? What's in, what's in, in, your, mi in your mind about the state of the weakness of democracies Mm. The lack of democracy in China, um, the way, you know, the extreme right deregulation of the financial system. Uh, because this has a lot to do with w how we eat, for instance, what we eat, and, and so on and so forth. Should this type of uh, reports say something, include something that is clearly more political? Um. I, I've spoken about, a, about 50 different topics, most of which I know nothing about, um, and that's another one. Um, so, I, no, I, I agree with you. Um, I, we need to mention it. I'm not quite sure what to say, except that um, 
just to, and this is going to sound very trite, but often crises give you the best opportunities. It's when people realise that something has to change. So um, there's probably opportunities at the moment as well, as, because people are sort of realising that we can't go on the way the way we were, and um, we need to um, have at least some more control over the way we live, um, and shouldn't just have, uh, hand it all to the bankers. And if you're starting to think about having some more control over the way we live, that includes these sorts of issues as well. Neil, this morning uh, you were actually there, we were discussing about different specific uh, research initiatives that we're taking between CREAD and CRECIP on a uh, study on indoor air pollution, a study on methods development for insecticide uh, measurements, etc. And, um, and you're talking about the wider picture. And sometimes when you look at the wider picture, you just uh, feel lost. You know, what am I doing uh, here? You know, I, I, will, I will be doing something on, uh, say, one cancer in Africa. Mm -hmm. So, but where does this whole thing enter? And you feel as if, you know, these are big issues, we have to tackle them. How do we tackle them and who tackles them? And this, I'm sure, will be an issue that you will uh, have to deal with at the, at the Center for uh, Global NCDs in the London School of Hygiene. So h how do you go along with, you know, fitting this global view with more sort of um, local or more specific initiatives because it's difficult to act, uh, you know, with a scheme yeah. with the three circles. Um, yeah, that, I'm going to get, well, I was going to say I'm going to get lots of questions, maybe not, but I'm going to, a high proportion of questions that I can't answer very well. Um, but, you know, sure, I'll go back to London tonight and, and do the same old stuff tomorrow. Um, it's not that we, um, we can change everything overnight, but it's important to keep these things in mind. That's the first thing. Se secondly, by having this sort of big picture, we can identify important areas that are just not being studied very much at all. Um, uh, neurological disease, I think, is one that's potentially... There's a lot of good research being done, but in terms of epidemiology, it's fairly new. We've put a lot of time into cancer and aspirin and so on, but neurological disease less so. Um, I think um, any good overview will also identify a lot of risk factors that are really important. Um, the, you know, the indoor cooking is one, but that's been studied quite a lot. Um, I would have thought here that the ability to study the link between infectious disease and NCDs is really important. And also there's not many places in the world actually where infectious disease and NCD people work together. So that's potentially a, a real strength here. Um, I guess the, uh, the only other comment I'd make is that um, the GBD study, you know, I was a co-author of some of those papers, but I have no idea how they got the estimates. They went into some computer model and came out again. It's part science, part astrology. But, um, but it's still really valuable because it does present the big picture. Um, for example, it shows that NCDs are really important in Africa, um, which... Um, you know, many people still refuse to believe. Um, so they can present the big picture and identify areas that we should really be um, focusing on in our very specific one risk factor, one, one outcome study. And I actually think, we, we've talked about this before, but um, I think we need something like Isaac for NCDs, uh, exposures and risk factors. We need random population surveys in as many countries as possible just to see what people are being exposed to and to look at the prevalence of many of these conditions because it just hasn't been done for a lot of NCDs and it hasn't been done for a lot of exposures. And if we could do that, there would be lots of spin-offs that would come in terms of the individual studies about specific hypotheses. And the problem is that funders don't want to fund these generic things. They, they want the idea that's going to win the Nobel Prize. Um, Isaac is coming to an end basically because no one wants to fund it because it doesn't fit the way that any of the, glow, uh, any of the big funding agencies work. But we need to find a way to do that and if we do, there'll be lots and lots of then very specific, much more scientifically interesting studies if we can do these basic risk factor and prevalence surveys to start with.
Thank you, Neil. A very nice um, overview, and as well, it puts us to think about how we handle with issues. But I, I can see two areas. One is, is to identify, as a researcher, to identify the causes of disease, and uh, obviously we have to focus in individual aspects in order to, to understand something. The other, is, and I think it was mixed up all the, all, in all your presentation, is how we change behavior. We know for many years that uh, tobacco is bad for the health, and uh, still our teenagers in our schools in Spain are, are mm -hmm. heavy smokers. And they do things that they are not good for their health, although we can um, bring to them good messages, uh, overall messages. So I was thinking that probably uh, education has a major role here. It's not only the politicians that they have to manage the, the um, how they organize the urban cities, how they organize things, but we have to empower, empower people so that they can think about how they want their life and how they want to live in better conditions. Yeah. And just one small example, when I was coming here, I was reading, uh, listening at the radio, and there was a program uh, from a, a factory that they just had in, in included some hours uh, every day of the happiness room, they said. And the happiness room included to do yoga, to do meditation, to do relaxation, to do uh, small talks. And uh, they do a survey and they they identify that just the introduction of these hours increase the happiness of the people. So, what's your opinion about how we can handle the education uh, in terms that we make people more able to decide how mm. they want to do things? I, well, once again, I don't know, except that we know from those large randomised trials that just health promotion on its own doesn't doesn't work very well. In fact, doesn't work at all. Um, we know from things like tobacco that when it's combined with legislation and you know macro level measures, then you can have an impact. But the individual health education has almost no impact unless you actually, you take action at the societal level as well. Having said that, also taking action at the societal level doesn't work unless there's acceptance of it. I was um, in France at the same time as you and Manolis, I think, when the anti-smoking legislation came in. And my favourite bar there, well, there was a few favourite bars, but one of my favourite bars had one chair marked non-smokers. So that was set aside for the non-smoker and everyone else in the bar smoked. And um, some countries are particularly good at just ignoring legislation, which is... Um, which is not popular. So you need both, and um, these things change over time. There's no magic bullet. But what we do need to do is get people in all these other areas, like urban design and planning and so on, thinking about health and health people being at the table. And I think if we keep just banging away about tobacco and salt and so on, we're actually excluding ourselves from that debate. So we, we need to have the bigger picture as well. Tony? Yes, thank you for this uh, broad presentation, which is, I think, uh, a real uh, luxury to have here. Uh, my question a little bit digs on, on your point and, and Sylvia's point, but from the other way around, because uh, in a sense, I think what you've showed is pretty much somehow the challenges of the interaction between science and policy. And probably the issue is not so much having more science, but being able to input the science in the decision-making process, which is not necessarily something very scientific, as, as we all know. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is the importance of uh, the intersectorial, and I'm talking from a top-down uh, approach as opposed to a bottom-up, the importance of the intersec intersectorial business, or I should say cooking, uh, in terms of the decision-making. And what happens is that, of course, we are faced with the hard fact that science is not uh, sorry, that health is not the only thing that matters to, to decision makers, even if there is science behind that. So my question was somehow from a uh, scientific standpoint, shouldn't we be looking at the obstacles? Because at the end, many of these decisions have to do with uh, those who fund 
policies. So at the end, is the Ministry of Health, uh, the Ministry of Economics or of uh, financial uh, whatever. So my question is, shouldn't there be, as part of the epidemiological knowledge, try to, the same way we, we, we approach health impact, use the impact approach from point of views that make sense for uh, decision makers and somehow not go alone in terms of the health arguments, but also ha add other strong arguments that may be more potent for the political agenda. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think um, we don't have to link all three agendas in everything we do, but it's good to keep all three agendas in mind because there are a lot of synergies which are actually um, very useful. For example, my, my guess is, I haven't seen a poll, but I, my guess is, is if someone suggested removing the congestion tax from London, it would be overwhelmingly opposed. Uh, overwhelmingly people are in favour of it. But if you ask beforehand, should we have a congestion tax because people are going to be healthier, no one would have voted for that. It would have been the nanny state. But if you have a congestion tax because London will be a nicer place to live, um, the traffic's too slow anyway, it, um, life will be better, people will vote for that. And, and at the same time, um, they'll be, be healthier. So we need to be looking for those synergies all the time, I think, because there's quite a lot out there which we're not really, we're not always taking advantage of. Okay. If there are no more questions, then uh, we will uh, finish here. Just a few more words. Um, one important is that um, we're talking about global health. Global health is very wide. So the next, actually, global health lecture will be on the 8th of May, uh, and it will be Diane Wirth from the Broad Institute from Harvard, and she will talk on uh, genetics and global health. That will be uh, May 8th at the Auditorium of SEC at the, um, uh, near the Hospital Clinic. So put this in your agendas. And, uh, through these global health lectures, we will have the possibility of seeing very, very different views, actually, and us and parts of global health. And uh, just to finish, uh, thanking again, Neil, for this uh, great uh, talk that uh, is, you know, will, will really help us in these very, you know, first steps that we're taking together, where we are starting really building what we want to be a, a, a very potent institute, and we're doing a lot of work, and it's great to have uh, this, um, uh, this type of more global view. So thanks a lot, Neil.